trouble when I um, when I just put it in and out of tablet mode, it throws a fit. Okay, which I just I don't understand it because it's a tablet, so it shouldn't freak out when it goes in and out of tablet mode. But for some reason, it loses itself, um, and I I don't know why that's the case. But anyway, um, okay, uh, let's look at this question now because we've got we've got some couple important things we need to go through. So, a transaction was reported as a non-monetary non-monetary exchange for assets under which of the following circumstances would the exchange be measured based and reported amount of the non-monetary assets surrendered and that was what that was basically our rule here when the transaction lacks commercial substance we're using what we're using the value of the asset surrendered right okay now um we take a look and um, of the non-monetary assets surrendered. Now we take a look here, and I wanted to show you also. We said that we should value the um, investment based on the value of the asset surrendered, okay, or the new asset, which an investment based on the value of the asset surrendered. And the rule was what? The book value plus any gain we recognize. So you could have gotten to that 3000 following our uh, flashcard rule as well. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's talk about intangible assets. Okay. And when we start talking about intangible assets, there are different types of intangible assets and sort of how we're going to approach these is going to um, depend on the nature of the intangible asset. So you come over here and you notice that you have different types of intangibles, okay? Copyrights, franchises, et cetera, okay? And intangible assets may be either specifically identifiable or patents or copyrights. We'll talk specifically about franchises in a minute or not specifically identifiable, um, which is the classic example is goodwill. Okay. Patent is specifically identifiable. Goodwill is sort of floating around out there. Okay. Now for intangible assets, okay, intangible assets acquired from others should be recorded as an asset at cost okay flashcard that the cost of developing an intangible asset should be expensed flashcard that so you see um tesla's financial reports if you ever pick those up and you see that they were showing losses year after year, whatever it was. And you say, well, why would anybody buy their stock? Well, what was causing the loss is that they were expensing all the research and development they were doing, right? Because under US GAAP, you have to expense all research and development. Now, if I come in behind and I buy the research from you, then I can capitalize that because I bought it from you, right? So you say, well, how would intangible ever hit the balance sheet? If it's acquired by a third party, the third party records it as an asset. The entity that develops it will expense it, okay? Now, there are um, exceptions to that general rule, okay? For example, legal fees to successfully defend the asset. If I acquired a patent and I get challenged as to my ownership of that patent and I have to go to court and I win, then I can go ahead and capitalize those legal fees. However, if I lose, I expense the legal fees and now I'm gonna write off that patent, right? That I had purchased from somebody else registration or consulting fees, design costs such as a trademark, 
any other direct cost to secure the asset they might talk to you about. Okay, so in this flashcard about expensing, you can go ahead and put on the blank side of the card under US GAAP, the cost of intangible asset not acquired from others, developed internally should be expensed. What are the exceptions to that rule? And then you can put the exceptions on the other side. Okay, now you come over and you will capitalize those costs and then you need to amortize those costs. And they say, hey, the value eventually will disappear and except for goodwill, which and, and assets with having to, which have indefinite life. For example, let's say you bought the right and there's no term as to how long you'll be able to hang up the golden arches in front of McDonald's and nobody ever knows when that's going to lose value, right? And so what happens? You wouldn't amortize that because it doesn't have any determinate life. But for things that aren't goodwill, like patents and those sorts of things, then you will uh, amortize those. And it is to be amortized um, using the straight line method. And it's over the shorter of the economic life or the legal life the shorter the economic life or the legal life, okay? Okay, good, and we should use straight line for that. You can put that on that flashcard up there. And then it says, they didn't say, um, they didn't say um, straight line in that pass key, but you can add that to the pass key flashcard that, okay? All right, good, let's talk about franchise accounting and we're talking about accounting from the standpoint of the franchisee this is the person buying the franchise we have talked about accounting for the entity selling the franchise in our revenue recognition requirements do you have one obligation several obligations is it over time is it all at one point remember we talked about all that back in when you were young back in f1 okay so that has already been uh, discussed. Now we're talking about the person that is acquiring the franchise, okay? And so we have an initial franchise fee and the present value of the amount to be paid by franchisee is recorded as an intangible asset on the balance sheet and amortized over this expected benefit of the franchise, assuming there's a finite determinate life. Again, if I somehow get into a deal where McDonald's tells me I can open up this McDonald's and I can hang the sign out there forever, then I'll amortize, I won't have to amortize the value of that franchise, okay? Now, flashcard that, make sure you're clear on that flashcard that you have to use present value. But then we have continuing franchise fee. And these are fees that are received for ongoing services provided by the franchisor to the franchisee. Okay, usually such fees are based on percentage of revenue and um, these fees flashcards should be reported by the franchise as an expense in the period incurred. So if I sit there and I say, hey, you know, I'm going to charge you 5% of your revenue for training you on the milkshake machine, then that's going to be an expense each period that you have to pay me that 5% of that revenue, whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this uh, example where this Peter signed an agreement on July 1st, year one with Disco Records, authorized a franchise. The initial franchise fee was $75,000, which was paid by $25,000 down payment and five equal payments of $10,000 beginning July 1st, year two. The expected life of the franchise is 10 years and the present value of the five payments is 37,908. Uh, they took 10,000 times present value of annuity factor at um, what was the interest rate on this? They don't give me the interest rate. It was 10% guys, I just remember uh, looking this up before. And so 10,000 times 3.7908 is where they got this 37,908. That's the present value of the remaining payments plus 25,000. We know from our flashcard, then they're gonna record the franchise at that fair value, right? Now, since they have done what? Since they have committed to 10 payments of 5,000 each, they credit 
uh, note payable for 50,000. And remember when we talked about note payable earlier in this chapter, we said that you would show what note payable at 50,000. You know that what? You know that the present value, the net note payable, is 37908 um, because you just calculated uh, that 37908 as the present value of those payments. And so the discount is the difference between those would be 12092 which is where they got the discount. And of course, you credit the cash for the amount of cash they got. Okay. Now, um, you take a look and they tell us, hey, you have to amortize the discount. I mean, not the discount. You have to amortize the franchise. And notice, guys, they bought it July 1st. So that's half a year of amortization. And when you amortize a uh, intangible, you debit amortization expense for the 3145. And there is no accumulated amortization account. You simply would credit directly to the franchise account for this 3145 as you amortize that down. Okay. Now, what they didn't mention at all here for some reason is there would also be an interest cost associated with this transaction. So we would take the 37,908, right? Which is the carrying value of that note payable. And guys forget about half a year. Well, I guess I can do half a year. We would take 37,908.10 times the half the year. Okay, anybody got a number for me there? 37908 times 0 0.1 times one half. One eight nine five point four zero. One eight nine five point four zero. You say, Matthew? Yeah. Okay, good. So I would have to do what? Debit interest expense. One eight nine five point four zero, and I would go ahead and de uh, and credit the discount. on the note payable here for this uh, 1895.40, in effect doing what? Bringing the um, carrying value of the note up to include that interest. And then when I go ahead and I pay that down, I'll continue to pay that down, et cetera, okay? Most important thing here, guys, because I don't want to get into all the liability accounting, and maybe that's why they didn't mention it here, but because uh, we'll do that in another chapter, but you would definitely have to take interest expense. That's my point here, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at startup cost. And startup costs, guys, are expensed. I mean, what FASB looks at there is most companies that are starting up do what? They don't make it. So we don't want them booking money that they're spending trying to get this thing off the ground, um, you know, as an asset. And then here comes some poor investor that's unaware of what's going on. And they have to sit there and, you know, uh, think that they're buying something. But in fact, it's just a bunch of, you know, bogus startup that's going on. Okay, that's why we have the same rule for research and development. Okay. I'm sorry, what was the uh, what was the actual part that was flash carded for the, the last one? Right here, just expense startup cost. Oh, okay, got you, got you. Got you. Yeah, just remember that. Okay, um, and then research and development costs, okay, are also expensed. So again, FASB's looking at that, and they did an empirical study back when they came out with FASB 2, and it showed that investors were harmed by the fact that companies were capitalizing research development, startup costs, because it made it look like there was something of value there when in fact there was not. 
So they turn around some years back and said, no, no more um, capitalization of startup costs, no more capitalization of, um, of um, you know, um, research and development, okay? But there are exceptions, okay? So I want you to take a look at some of the exceptions, okay? Materials, equipment, facilities that have alternative future use. If that's the case, go ahead and capitalize that, and then you will depreciate that. Because they're saying, hey, the benefit there is extending beyond the current period. So if you bought a depreciable asset that has some time left on it, then you're going to go ahead and you're going to um, go ahead and you can capitalize that and depreciate that, okay? Um, research and development that's taken on behalf of others, okay? Now, if I'm doing research and development under contract for you, then I am in effect creating something that has future economic benefit because under the contract, you're gonna come along and buy it from me, right? So I'm creating an inventory for which I know there's value because you're under contract to buy it from me for a certain price. So if that's the case, uh, I can capitalize it. However, the purchaser will expense that research and development when they acquire that from me now, because again, somebody has to expense that research and development. The only reason I'm capitalizing it when I'm doing it for you is because I know I have a contract that allows me to do what? To sell it to you, okay? Um, um, okay, those are the exceptions. It's two exceptions there. Okay, now items not considered research and development. Okay, and the idea here is these are expenses. Put down these are expenses, but not R and D. Okay, they are expenses, but they're not R and D. Marketing research. Okay. Um, well, let's come up. Routine periodic design changes to old products. Okay, that means I already have a product. I'm not researching and developing. Um, marketing research, quality control testing. I don't know what reformulation of a chemical compound is, but you can go ahead and put that on your flashcard if you want. Um, but basically, what we're sitting here and saying, hey, you already have a product. If you're incurring these kind of costs, you have a product, you're no longer in a research and development stage, okay? So you look at this question, okay, this example, and notice that, um, you know, materials used in research and development, that's expense. The equipment, but it has alternative uses. So we take the depreciation and we include it what this question is asking, let me back up a little bit, is what should be included in the research and development line item on the financial statements? FASB is giving us rules for that, right? Okay. Personal cost of people involved in the research and development, consulting fees, and the key phrase is here, it's all being spent for research and development, but all of this is expenses, the research and development line item. If an asset has alternative future uses, you don't take the whole amount as depreciate as um, research and development, but you do take the depreciation. Okay. Okay, good. Let's talk about software development costs. Okay. And they tell us that we should expense cost until technological feasibility is achieved. Now, this is where FASB gets annoying, guys because they tell us to expense all research and development, but then they turn around and they do what? They turn around and they give us a special rule for software, okay? So software expense cost until technological feasibility, capitalize cost after technological feasibility. So the key phrase here is what? Technological feasibility, that's what you gotta look for. Okay, and if you see that they've incurred costs before, expense, after, capitalize. Okay, now once you have capitalized those, then you have to amortize it and you amortize capital, uh, capitalized costs 
on the greater of, and it's the greater of either one of these. Now, let's just use an example here. Let's say I have a company, I just want to peek at my little example, that is uh, spent, that has capitalized, I should say, $100,000. Okay, they've capitalized $100,000 of computer software development cost. Okay, and they have to amortize that. And let's say that the total projected revenue for the project is, say, $4 million. Okay, and let's say that the economic life of this, and guys, I understand that software doesn't have a 10 year life, but I just want to make the problem fit numbers easily, okay, is 10 years. So what happens if in year one, let's say, my revenue for the period is a million, then a million divided by 4 million is going to give me what, 25%? If the economic life is 10 years, then the straight line is going to give me 10%, not a trick question, in year one, which one should I use? The 25%, right? Okay, now let's say, and I'm just gonna go ahead and use red here for year two. Let's say in year two now, let's say for whatever reason, my revenue is only say, and I'm again, just making these numbers up, 200,000. Well, that means that the percent of revenue in year two is what? 5%. So for year two, which one's greater? The straight line in year two, I would use a straight line. So you toggle between straight line and percentage of revenue, depending on what? which one is greater, okay? And that's the uh, flashcard here, which one is greater, okay? Now, um, the- A quick question on that. Is that the revenue, that's the total gross revenue of the company or is that the revenue from this particular software? From the product. From the product, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that can change from year to year, but we call that change in accounting estimates. So we don't have to go back and restate anything if that estimate changes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Now, inventory, we're creating inventory and we should carry it at the lower of cost or net realizable value. So, you know, if for some reason the net realizable value had fallen below 100,000, we'd have to write it down to that lower amount, right? Okay. Okay, good. Come over and computer software now uh, developed internally or obtained for uh, internal use. Okay. And expense cost incurred through the preliminary project state. So, guys, now. We're changing the word technology, technological feasibility with preliminary project, and we're going to use this software internally. Okay, we capitalize cost after the preliminary project state. So we're just replacing one phrase for the other here. But now the idea is that what we're going to use this software internally. We will amortize, since we're not really thinking we're going to sell this software externally, then we would just use straight line. Okay, so you can flashcard that. Now, this gets a little annoying because they say, well, what if, you know, people come and say, hey, we want to buy that software from you and you sell the software and they get into all this, you know, if the software previously developed for internal use is subsequently sold outsiders, proceeds received should be applied first to the carrying amount of the software then recognized as revenue after the carrying amount of the software has been has reached zero in other words book a game if you sell it for less than what it's being carried at right the amount first goes to carry the cover the carrying value if you sell it for more that's a gain if you sell it for less that's a loss okay okay good Let's take a look at a couple of multiple choice questions. I don't know where the poll is now. I guess it's still on the main machine here.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and look at this one. And uh, I think we're getting tired. So uh, we're kind of all over the place on this. So let's just look and uh, see what the correct answer was. Uh, I don't even know off the top of my head. So let me, let's go ahead and let's look at this one together. Okay. So um, we have what? We have this uh, Gary company granted a patent on January 2nd and appropriately capitalized 45,000. Okay, so if I appropriately capitalized 45,000, I know I gotta take that, okay? Now, they uh, were amortizing the patent over 15 years. So if I divide 45,000 by 15, what do I get, 3,000 per year? All right, okay, yes. now, now what? Now they say during year four, okay, now let's think about this for a second. If it's during year four, that means, and I got the patent on January 1st, okay, then what? Then I have year one, year two, year three. I amortized it for three years, didn't I? Okay, so I take that 3,000 times the three years. That means I've taken at least 9,000 of amortization here. So I go ahead and I subtract 9,000, 45 minus nine is what, 36? 36, yeah. Okay, so before anything happened in this question, I was sitting there at 36,000, right? Then what? Then I paid 15,000 of legal fees to successfully defend the infringement. Is that something I should capitalize? Yes. I was successful, good. So I go ahead and I add in that 15,000, that brings me up to what, 51,000? And then the person who challenged me, whatever I guess, said, hey, okay, I'll give you 75,000. I tried to steal it from you, but apparently that didn't work. So I'll pay you 75,000. So if they pay me 75,000 and it has a what, carrying value of 51, that's a gain of 24,000? Yep. Okay, good. I like that question because it tests a lot of the rules. Uh, what might have um, confused you is they said they appropriately capitalized 45,000. Don't argue with the question. I don't know what the nature of these costs were that they figured out that they were appropriately capitalized. It must have been one of the exceptions that we talked about in generating a patent, but you can't argue with the question. So, well, wait a minute, they can't do that. That's not how you attack a question like this. If they tell you they appropriately capitalized, you accept that, you go from there. Okay? Okay, good. You come over and you look at this one. Number two. We're gonna do two and three, and then I said that we were gonna finish the chapter even if it kills us, and that's not true because we're not gonna finish um, intangibles to uh impairment i should say tonight but um it'll take us like 10 minutes next time to do it and then we'll get into chapter four finally Pull.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. So make your best choice because I don't, we're getting kind of running out of time now. Um, but um, I don't know, we're, we're getting tired. So let's just look at this one. Um, so we have what? We have 50,000 that we pay for this franchise. And then they tell us that we're going to have to do what? We're going to have to take a 3% uh, of franchise operation revenue uh, and pay that for franchisee operations. And they tell us the amount of revenue, but then they wanna know, well, what should they report on the balance sheet? Well, this percentage of revenue thing is not gonna affect the asset account. It's simply an expense that gets reported straight on the income statement. So now all I have to worry about is the amortization on this thing. And if it's a what? 10 year life, that means it's what? 5,000 per year. So at December 31st, about the thing January 1st, I would have taken that first year of the amortization. So I would have been carrying the asset at 45,000, right? Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's go ahead and let's look at this one together, question three, so we can move through it a little more quickly. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this damn company incurred the research and development project costs during the current year. And they give me these different things and the equipment has a five year useful life and is depreciated using straight line method, what amount should I recognize as research and development, okay? Now I start looking at this list and I start seeing these different things here and I go with the low hanging fruit, guys. I'm like, okay, well, that's obviously research and development. And you're saying, well, big deal, John. I'm also looking at the choices and I know I can't get there without that one. So I go ahead and I pick that up, right? Then I sit here and I look at what equipment purchase for current and future projects. Well, if that's the case, then what? Then that's one of the exceptions that the equipment has a future alternative use, but I do take the depreciation on that, don't I? So I take the 100,000 and I divide that by, what was the life of the equipment? The equipment has a, five year life, 100,000 divided by five means that I'm doing 20,000 a year on that depreciation. So I know I've got to pick that up. And then I kind of start looking at the choices, guys, and I'm only seeing one that's got, you know, this 20,000 in it. So I kind of start coveting that one a little bit, but I'm not quite done yet. Then I look and it says equipment purchase for current projects only. Well, what does that mean? It's research and development, but it has no future alternative life. So I need to what? Go to my normal rule expense, the whole thing. Okay. Then they tell me legal fees to uh, obtain a patent. Well, look, that's not research and development expense. That's one of the exceptions of what I would capitalize to a patent account, right? When I pay the legal fees. So I'm not going to pick that up. And then I'm looking and I'm saying, well, there's only one other answer in here that's got a 20,000 that's going to get me to an answer with 20,000 here. Okay. So I go ahead, you know, because there's no 620,000. So I have to pick up what the prototype item. And you're sitting there saying, well, John, we didn't say anything about prototypes in the lecture. And I agree with you. Maybe we should have called that out. I'm showing you the test taking technique as to how you would have sort of got there. But by the same token, a prototype is what? I really don't have a product yet. I'm still trying to develop a product if I'm in prototype stage, right? I'm not having something that I can say is going to actually come to fruition or not if I'm on a prototype stage. Okay, so the answer here is C. Question. Okay, guys, good work. We will wrap up um, 
chapter three next time. We have that one last module on impairment and we will jump into chapter four next time. Question? Okay, guys, I will put up what part of the recording I have available. I don't know when we had our technical difficulty if I lost everything or not. And then I have some back order ones that I need to get up there for you for the uh, previous lectures. Okay, have a good week. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. All right, Thank guys. Bye-bye.